Welcome to Uploading, the podcast where we take you behind the wheel with the world's best creators, marketers, and professionals who have cracked the code on how to profit through content. You'll learn the ins and outs of content strategy, creation, production, distribution, growth, platforms, tools, and more. If you haven't already, be sure to join Cast Magic, the all-in-one content workspace for professionals. We'll be sending out tips from our shows in our weekly newsletter, and we've also got a Slack community of over a thousand creators, so make sure to drop in and say hello. And now, get ready for the show. What's going on, Uploading? I'm really looking forward to this episode today because we have a special guest, and that special guest is Eugenio Castro, um, who we had the pleasure of working with, actually, for some time now, and has let us realize the value that there is when it comes to operations for being a creator. And one of those key pillars of operations is research. And Eugenio is, um, you know, definitely world-class guy when it comes to research. And it's something that a lot of creators are leveraging today in order to make their podcast a better experience and overall applying it to every line of work that they do. So Eugenio, I'll let you speak to your business, your background, and what exactly you do, but welcome to uploading. Awesome. Thank you for having me, Ramon and Blaine. It's great to see you guys again. And I'm excited to talk about research. So I've been doing research for 13 months now. I started in 2023 in January and it completely changed my life. I worked with some amazing people with my heroes, I would say people that I really looked up to before I started working for them. And I've learned a lot and I've realized that there's a massive demand for research and I'm still in the process of figuring out how to best capture it but essentially the value that it gives to uh, a person or a company is the ability to sort of have their re- their content generation machine the research component of sort of a outsourced or delegated to someone that knows what they're doing and they don't have to set it up themselves and I think any person or company that has a media machine, the moment that that media machine starts generating content about something that is not just about the company or the person, they're like their stories uh, and their value props, but they want to talk about something external to them. That's when research comes in because research helps capture what that is factually, precisely. And then we give it to the content creator or the company's media uh, machine and they do their copywriting on that. So it helps. Uh, so that's what research is for uh, in content. Uh, in the content world is for people or companies that want to talk about things that are not just about themselves, but in their niche or outside themselves in some aspect. That's where research comes in. And there's there's a lot of use cases, a lot of like work streams, and we can talk about some of them, but broadly what research is. Yeah, and you've, you've, you know, can you share, um, for example, a, an example of the type of research that you do and maybe one or some of the clients that, that you do this for? For sure. Well, one of the most common work streams or the most common that I've encountered is interview preparation. So helping a uh, podcast host really get to know everything about their podcast guest and that information those insights that we pull for them help them ask better questions and help them be confident and not ask questions that were asked in the guests last podcast because the guests i research are people that are constantly on podcasts and are famous people so they they have a lot of information and you don't want as a podcast host like ask them the same question and not provide any uh, additional value for the audience. So that's that's one of the most common ones. And I like to think of it almost as uh, Jamie as a service. Jamie, the uh, Joe Rogan's like research guide. Uh, Joe Rogan is like, oh, Jamie, pull it up. And that's kind of like what I do, but before the interview prep. And I've done it during the interviews for some clients. Uh, I'm not, I haven't done that lately, but I sort of was that uh, like a remote Jamie for some people. For some time and and it's a lot of fun uh, but yeah interview prep is one of the most common ones others are like a podcast host wants to talk about a business i research that business make sure they get it right and then they get to sort of just do the creative stuff of giving their take uh uh 
sort of remixing the research into like a, a hook and a quick baby, not really quick baby, but something that's more attractive to people and that just bullet points. And I would say the, the biggest person that I work with is uh, Sam Farr. I feel comfortable saying it because uh, he told me to put his name on my Twitter bio and he told me that I should change. I used to have like a artwork as an image and he said I should put my face on it. And, and yeah, so I'm, I'm Sam Farr's researcher. And from there, from just having that name on my bio, I've, I've been, I get like weekly uh, DMs, people wanting to work with me. So I've been building a team. Uh, but yeah, interview preps and then uh, like business research or also like person research, even though they're not going to interview a person, they want to get their facts right on a person or an, a, an event. Like like when SDB, the back thing happened or the open AI saga, like getting those facts right and leading to the uh, right tweets so that they can on a Google talk to what would take them three hours, it takes them 15 minutes. Yeah. And getting those facts right is really important. Like there's a lot of trust into having you do the research, you know, if they have someone important coming as, as a guest and you throw out a fact of their life and you're wrong um, about that. And they're like, no, I didn't do that. Um, that would be pretty embarrassing for the guest. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of trust that goes into what you do and, and fully trusting you on that research. And um, it's really impressive to see like how you keep earning that trust from bigger and bigger creators. So I definitely want to touch into your background, though. You were born and raised in Mexico. Um, you still live there. So how did you start working with such big names and continue to go up the ladder, um, you know, to, to continue to earn that trust? Twitter, man. Twitter, Twitter is like the town square of the Internet. People post the problems. People hire other people, people tweet about uh, things that they need. So just by seeing that and then reaching out to people, that's sort of opened every single door. But obviously, it's not just about like reaching out. It's about having something to deliver. And in my case, uh, what got me started here, uh, Moise Ali from the Limited Supply Podcast posted that he was looking for a podcast researcher. And I was a huge fan of, I, I still have a uh, Moise Ali, Nick Sharma, the Limited Supply Podcast. Before Limited Supply, Moise Lee had a podcast with The Hustle called Exit Strategy, and he would interview DTC founders that had massive exits. So I'd listened to everything he'd ever put out there and read everything that he ever put out there. So I had a very strong mental model of Moise in my head. So I reached out uh, and applied to that role, and, and I got it. And my advantage was that I had all these like two or three years of listening to Moise const- constantly, uh, consistently. So. So that helps. So Twitter and the, like Twitter and my own natural curiosities and me liking this stuff uh, is sort of how I managed to open the door and the other doors have been opening because uh, by not by not messing up and showing up and answering fast and not getting the facts wrong. Yeah, I'm um, eating your own dog food. You got them through researching them properly. So. Um, oh, yeah. you know, clearly you, you built a product, um, that, that you truly believe in, which is also what makes you great at it. So, um, you know, can you walk us through like what your research process looks like? Um, in that example, you know, you be, you had a mental model of Moise and I assume that for your clients, you want to do such good work that they can almost have a mental model of the guests that they're going to have, or, or for the company to have a mental model of the industry. They're trying to research. So um, w- what are these frameworks, systems, and, and what does your typical um, research process look like? Sure. I'll, I took on to mind the more practical one and then the more theoretical one. The more practical one is you choose a subject and implicit in that uh, decision is like what you want to know about the person. Because if you just do like a generic report, it's really of no value. It's like a uh, jack of all trades, master of none. That sort of applies to documents. Like if it's just uh, generic but comprehensive take on a subject, and then it's like uh, I could have just read the Wikipedia. So, anyways, first you choose a topic, then you gather links, all the relevant links, all the you go to YouTube, you search the subject. Uh, let's talk about uh, imagine this subject is a person, but it could also be an entity like a company or something like an event. But, anyways, imagine it's a person, you uh, put the name on YouTube, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, and then you gather all the relevant interviews, all the relevant links from those platforms, put them on a Google Doc, uh, and then you enter that subject's name on a tool like Perplexity or Google. And also there, you uh, gather 
the most important things. And as you read the headlines, as you read the sub headlines, you start building your mental model of the person. But you, you're still you're just doing that. You're just gathering links now and building a mental model. And when you have all the links, you start taking uh, notes of what's up. You start like skimming through them and just extract very uh, uh, brief notes that you know are going to be important. And when you have gone through all the links and have taken like the most essential notes, then you sort of sit down and step back and decide the frame and the angle of the piece. Because again, if you just stop at that or do something very generic, it's got to be of no value. So you need to repurpose it to something very, very specific. And in my case, it's usually, it's always the client and their objective, what they want to talk about. So like Sam, any financial information that's going to go at the top of the Google Doc, and I'm basically going to ignore everything else because he wants to talk about numbers uh, as an example. Or maybe someone like Nick or Moise, they want to talk about how they launched, like the launch strategy of, of that product. So, so that's uh, so you decide to frame now with the information and sort of like an outline, you sort of picture what the end product is going to look like. But you can't really do that before you read about it because that outline changes with the information you see. So, now that you have the angle, then you uh, just organize your notes and extract additional notes that are relevant and always keep it very, very short and very brief. I feel like most people expect that the longer their research is, the more value it'll have to the person that's reading it. But it's actually the inverse. You want a very high signal and very low or like zero noise. And counterintuitively, my clients pay me for what I leave out of the document, not so much for what I put in. Because again, they didn't go to perplexity. They didn't go to Google. But if I, but they have to sift through the noise. So they just want to get the signal. So that's uh, like a very practical one. Collect links. Take notes, sit back, decide like what the end product will look like, and then reorganize everything according to that end product. And and another more theoretical uh, approach or way of thinking that has really helped me is that research is just data retrieval. It's like Google, basically. The only difference is that Google pulls, they do like the, the ranking and they show you the links and, and whatever, and, and they have some information in you, but very little or a lot, but not the right type of information. Like the information I have about the client, the mental model I have about the client serves as a filtering function for all the, the information that I retrieve. And it ends in a place where it's way more, uh, it's like made to fit for them to spoke. Uh, so the client, the, the mental model of the client, so it's researched what it is like Google plus a very a uh, clearly defined mental model of a client and a very clear model and understanding of their objective. So I think uh, eventually this will be automated in, in some in some in some way. Yeah, I mean, look, some of it I automated myself with Cast Magic, where I'll research the previous interviews of those people um, that we might have as a guest, and I think it's really important what you said of what you leave out. And a good way that I use Cast Magic is to like. Look, you know, find the interviews of those people and know what to leave out because if the guest is big, they've likely been on a lot of podcasts and you don't want to talk about the same stuff that they've talked about on every podcast. And so it's also a fine balance of like how you do the research to not talk about the same thing and not end in the same sort of topics and conversations and have your own twist um, into the conversation and the only way you can do that, like, you know, Google isn't going to tell you um, what is the stuff they haven't talked about. Um, and that is where like in-depth research probably um, comes into play. So one more thing I want to talk about is like, how can, you know, when you're when you're asking in-depth research questions and data extraction and all of this, um, all of this can be monetized. Like this content and this media can be monetized. And I know... You know, Greg Eisenberg has an image where it all starts with research and then it plays into monetization. So how can you use research not only to create content, but ultimately to monetize the content, which is, you know, the, the number one goal mostly of, of anyone who creates content? Right. So I think that would take me to the other half of... So research needs are, from my perspective, fundamentally divided into two categories to make content or to make decisions. So 
I've worked with some people and I haven't sort of uh, gone super deep because it's, it's hard and I have a uh, good momentum on the content side, but people are willing to pay a lot of money for information that they feel will help them make a better decision. So what that looks like is something like what Steph Smith recently launched. She has a product. It's not a course. It's like a, a collection of resources of sources called internet pipes. So she includes things like, uh, like how to, uh, certain sources to figure out what's trending on Reddit. And I haven't bought it, I think for hundred dollars, but that's like an example of, I think how you monetize research is by putting it behind a paywall and say, this is what you'll get <laughs> if you pay. And then having that on the other side. So that's like the easier one. And then the other one, which is, I haven't experimented with that one at all. I, I really want to, but the other one is giving people the sort of, uh, research like Jamie, but now like a personal research assistant, like on their Slack, they have someone that they can ask any question to, and they'll take a day, but they'll give a very precise answer uh, to what that person wants. So that's like, so the first way is like research behind a payroll. Second is a service, a personal research assistant as a service, research as a service. That's way harder, obviously. Uh, like how do you scale that uh, technology training people? And then the third one is also like the second one, research as a service, but it's more project-based and it's more to be. And that's like consultant replacement. Like replace a consultant uh, for, and I've done like two or three deals uh, uh, on that. And, and Ramon, you sort of send me a deal that's in that direction, which like, I have a very specific thing. It's like a project, go and research it. So those would be like three ways, paid wall, personal research assistant as a service or projects, research projects on a per project basis. Those are the three ways that I've seen other than for content to make my to research. And then Eugenio, on the content side of things, I think what's so interesting about research, and I'd love for you to kind of paint the picture for our listeners, it's like, especially if you're running a show where it's, if you're interviewing one thing, I think research is like pretty obvious. You want research so you can ask better questions, you can guide the conversation, you have talking points, et cetera. But I think a lot of people who are listening maybe don't understand how big of a role research plays in kind of like the dialogue format shows. I know you mentioned Nick and Moise. I know you mentioned Sam, um, Sam and Sean and how, how their show is. So just from behind the scenes, what does it look like when they're coming together with a show? Like how much of that is your research informing the content strategy in terms of like what they're putting out and, you know, them as the creator, obviously they're able to monetize because they've got this flywheel of content, but if you could just paint the picture of how much of the content that you're hearing on the episodes is is directly kind of coming from the the research that you know you or other people like you are are you know doing behind the scenes. Sure, uh, it changes sometimes. Uh, well, like for MFM recently, they started sending out prep like questions to the guests directly and just asking for ideas. But before it was like I want to talk about your background, but now the format is changing a bit to we're just trying to talk about it. So no research is really needed there. I, I always do research and send it to Sam just so that he knows more background, feels more confident. But uh, before, or like when it's not an interview and they're riffing, the research would reflect on like the topics that are chosen. So what is brought up? Research helps with that. Research, uh, uh, a part of research like interview preps. Another one would be, which I also do for Sam, uh, topic recommendations. And that's recommending things to talk about. And then once uh, one of those topics is recommended, uh, is chosen by the client, doing in-depth research on that and surfacing the most interesting insights. So I think if you're a content creator and you have your flywheel and you consistently have good guests and you have an audience, what research, like a good research assistant or a, a good Jamie uh, ensures that you'll sort of talk about the best things possible and you don't repeat things that have already been asked or talked about so people would find it boring because they already listened or heard about it and it also ensures that you sort of have a wider view that that which you could achieve by just yourself and your daily life you have a full-time person thinking about topics and this is what it was like when i was just working with nick and moise i was just on dtc twitter on the dtc newsletters all day every day 
And that is so valuable for a big creator because again, you won't have like dull conversations bringing up things that have already been talked about. And you also find interesting things that are like appropriate or would make a lot of sense to talk about in that moment and would draw people's attention. And then you're, uh, when the topic, like the subtopics, like you sort of find the revenue that no one really talked about because you need someone to look for it for like two hours to service it, or you find this direct take from a quote, a quote attributed to a person on that company's team. So I think it would be reflected in avoiding redundancy and finding cool things to talk about and then finding the cool things about those cool things to talk about. The next question I had, um, or the follow-up to that was going to be, how else can you repurpose the research, right? Like, so obviously you're able to use the research in, you know, you may or may not use it in the conversation as a content creator, but what else can you do with that research as a content creator to promote it? Like, for example, for us, and I'm curious what you see on, on your side and the clients that you work with, but for us, we have research done for our podcast like we're having with you so we can have great conversations but then through that we're able to actually repurpose that research and use it for other mediums like our site content our newsletter that sort of stuff as well so is that something else that you see in your sort of workflows your your research being able to be upstream and then also being able to be repurposed into other sort of content absolutely i think for the podcasts it's used for riffing purposes like uh common ground and then from there people start giving their takes or asking questions to the guest based on that. But then that can just very easily by a copywriter, those concise bullet points, be converted into a nice Twitter thread, X thread, or a newsletter. So I've, I've worked with, I've done research for newsletters at Twitter people as well. And, and, and it works because the copywriters don't have to worry about researching anymore. They just have to worry about copywriting. And if you're someone or you, you want your brand to write about like stories from the past or stories from an industry, research content to play. And I feel like right now, a lot of people are asking their copywriters to do that research. And I feel like those copywriters, the ones that I've talked to always say, and the experience I've had with them is like having a researcher would cut my work in by so much because again, yeah, it's just the bullet points with their proper citations. But it, it takes time, it, it, it re- and this is what I've I've sort of uh, realized that I can only work with so many different types of clients that have so many different types of objectives and are operating in so many different niches before everything just starts getting harder. And that's sort of where what happened to me. And now I'm sort of focusing on interview preps and obviously staying with Sam Far because he's amazing and I learn from him every day. Uh, but yeah, that I think there needs to be a lot of researchers, not just me. And each researcher have like their own niche their own format specialty, and then collaborating with copywriters. I think that would be huge and copywriters would work less and focus more on what they like. So you mentioned, for example, you work with Sempar, you like working with him. And you also mentioned that these other, you can only expand to so many different niches and verticals. Um, But even within the same niche and vertical, I'm sure there also has to be the dynamic of you working with the right client, the right creator. Um, What is it about, you know, you worked with, besides him, part other big names in the creator space. What are the common themes you've seen of what make these people a great to work with and be like so successful at what they do? Yeah. I mean, they're, everyone's reply time is super fast. So they're always on, I guess. Uh, they like, at least what I learned with Sam and Moise and Nick is a very low tolerance for inefficiency or for just not doing your best. So I feel like I had the uh, privilege of learning from, or like adhering to the standards, being made uh, adherent to such high standards. So I think they just have very high standards. Like they'll, if I get something wrong, which I guess happens from time to time, they'll call it out. So I would say there always seems to be on and definitely it doesn't mean that you can't take your break. And the other thing is that, uh, but the only thing that I think there's no compromise in is equality. They sort of can, they can tell the noise from the signal. And if you give them something that's noise or get a fact wrong, they'll, yeah, they, they all like it. And so, yeah, I think they just have like very, very high standards in, in everything they do. What is, what is bad research? Like, 
what does bad research look like for somebody Jen. who might like hire a researcher on Upwork and has not seen the quality of your work? How can they detect what is bad research? I'd say uh, good research has every single claim verifiable, cited. Those citations, if they take you to a YouTube video, they will take you to the link to second. So the exact second where that claim is being, because in YouTube, you can right click and then link to second. And that's so valuable for, for people. Or on a website, you can do link to text. So that's one verifiability and then like uh, valuable citation, not just like something that's unusable. Uh, the other one is concise. If they, you can tell that uh, they, uh, like sort of gone through everything and just get the most important thing. So it's short, uh, it's not generic. And the third would be, it's also not just like bullet points. It's, it's, it makes sense. It's not a story, but it's, I would say, uh, semantically junk is what I call it. So there are, uh, like if they're talking about a company and they're talking about their financials and all of those bullet points are in the same section. If they're talking about their founding story in the same section. So I see all the time with my team that that's also not intuitive. Like they talk about their founding, then the revenue, and then again, their founding. And that sort of breaks the flow. So uh, I, I, I think uh, verifiability, short and concise, and it flows well. So the main thing, I, I think, that's from that third thing is that it's easy to read. If it's hard to read, it's not good research. If, if it just, uh, if it gives you dopamine and you're like, this is awesome, <laughs> and you just sort of like smoothly, uh, you go from top of the documents, bottom of the document, that's good research. And so, so you have the like time I bring every claim that makes sense to anchor in time has a date. Because what generates noise is like those unanswered questions where you're like, all right, this is a founding story, but when did they launch? Like they didn't mention everything. Or who's the founder? Like covering all those questions that someone might ask as they're reading and answering them. Because you ask more, like a single one answer question from a client as they read top down, that generates noise. And then you have a citation that doesn't take them to a link to second, that generates more noise. So a good research document has zero noise, zero friction, and it's a pleasure to read. It's it's fun to read. Yeah. At the end of the day, they're, they're hiring you to save time, right? Like they're hiring mm -hmm. you to have to do this research themselves. And I'm curious, like, how many rounds of revisions or how much time does one of these documents typically take? Because I can see reading myself, reading a research and being like, actually, that's really interesting. Let's go back and expand on that one part. Um, right. Like what, it, I guess like another way to ask this question is like, is that one of your KPIs to try and like get less and less sort of revisions on each round you do? Yeah. Absolutely. I would say, I think, uh, I think more so Lee is the one that I had to thank the most for this because he gave me such detailed feedback one time. And then that was like all the feedback I needed. So I usually don't get that much feedback clients because uh, I just, I, we and my team, we try really hard to get it right and not uh, have them give feedback. But if they do give feedback, it's something like that. Like, oh, I want to know more about this. It's not like this is wrong. Don't do it like this. I mean, they're paying me so they don't have to do that. Right. And like, train someone in-house uh, but anyways like but every time I get uh, a feedback from a client it's super valuable I, I guess uh, a client that I can name drop because uh, I talked about him once he said it was cool David Perel he, his interview preps are some of the most comprehensive and hardest ones because his clients are so uh, high profile and there's like a scale of complexity and it, like I would be uh, complexity one like the easiest because I have a uh, LinkedIn this is my first podcast and a Twitter. But then, I don't know, uh, Sam Alton, who uh, David said it publicly, so I feel comfortable uh, speaking about this. He has like so many interviews and so many tweets and so many blog posts. But anyways, he gave me uh, some really nice feedback. He like filmed the room. And, but again, not really like uh, more, more so than more explaining like the directions that he wants us to take like not don't just write about the writing process also research about something that's unexpected or obscure about the person so that type of feedback is amazing and and i feel like all, all of that feedback of like what north star should look like it's sort of applicable to all the other clients and our research in general 
it's not just like, oh, David Perel is the only person that wants to know obscure things about a person. So like every client would appreciate knowing obscure things about a subject so that they could talk to them if they, if they so choose. Uh, but yeah. yeah, one of the things I find so interesting about just research and the role it plays within content creation, it's almost like you have traditional legacy media where all those people, you've got the talking heads that are like sitting on the screen and they all have writers and researchers and teams producing all that content. And then they have mass distribution. And as the content uh, you know, creator economy expands, it's like the best content creators now are bringing in the vid their own in-house video production, research, scripting, like all of this stuff as well. So that's not to say that you necessarily need to outsource your research to start, but it is to say that if you're going to be a compelling content creator, research is definitely a big component of that. And then as you scale and as you need more efficiency, like it becomes something that's like a major unlock and in a lot of cases, a completely essential thing for a lot of these big creators. I remember when we talked with you, Eugenio, I was like kind of mind blown that like all these other big creators, like they had so much research and prep and operations happening behind the scene, right? So I think that's that's something that's really important for other content creators to understand. It's like, you know, in the beginning, you want to handle as much of it as you can. But as you start to scale and you start to like offload time and start to look for efficiencies, like bringing on the right sort of researcher to your team can be a massive unlock to your to your content. Absolutely. Um, as we wrap up here, Ohenio, we just have like a, a, a little lightning round to ask. So um, my first question is going to be, who is your, I know you've worked with a couple, maybe why don't we name someone who, um, you know, is separate from the ones we've talked about, but who's one of your f favorite creators today and why? I think Greg Eisenberg, because... Like this pod, I talked with Ramon about what is podcast the other day, and I think he's like so on the edge on the podcast. He just, I think he doesn't really do a lot of research, uh, but he like gets like so open with the ideas. Like he's not afraid to really like play with like almost like metaphysical stuff and content, like like a banco say. And I feel like my mind, my mind sort of like expands every time I listen to uh, like what Greg Ashenberg interview. Cool. Next question is, if you had zero followers and you're like an emerging creator, like where are you going to create content? Like which platform and why? I mean, I have zero followers and what I would do is I have hundreds and hundreds of different topics that I could just repurpose in my voice for my Twitter. So I would do that. I would just uh, focus on that. But honestly, that's not my, my core expertise. And I started doing research because I needed to make money. But now I'm sort of thinking like, how can I sort of start making content myself? So that's a question that I'm actively thinking. And, and last one is who is maybe a, either someone who's a creator that employs like solid research or just a general co content creator that you think is like really up and coming. So it hasn't necessarily like blown up yet, but like you're following along and you think they're going to, they're going to be big. Uh, Danny Miranda, he is also very uh, close to the research work. He, he does great research on his clients, on uh, his clients, on his guests before he introduces them. I'm sorry, I'd, I'd say Danny. I feel like he's going to be like Lex Friedman in Fire 10 years. I love that. Um, all right. And for anyone who's listening, where can we connect with you? Why don't you shout out your Twitter, your socials, and where we can find you? Well, hell yeah. I'm on Twitter, on X. Uh, it's Eugenio, E-N-I-O, underscore, uh, com, uh, C-O-M, underscore, M-X, like, dot com, dot M-X. I'm from Mexico. So I'm on Twitter. Definitely send out a DM or give me a follow and we'll connect. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. Likewise, Ramon. Always a pleasure to talk with you guys.